Stan Jibalisco here, continuing our little tutorial video sequence in regards to the book Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics, published by McGraw-Hill in October of 2013. This is the third edition. I would like to refer you also to a playlist name for all of these videos, Beginner's Schematics. Just go to my YouTube channel and go to the playlist Beginner's Schematics. This third edition, edited by me, previous editions by Traster and Lisk, the paper-bound version which I recommend over the electronic version for a variety of reasons that I have ranted about probably more than you would ever care to hear if you've listened to all of my rants. <laughs> oh, God help you if you've listened to them all. Spiral binding, heavy stock paper, requires no battery, acquires no bugs nor viruses, you don't have to boot it up, and if you spill your Diet Mountain Dew on it all, all it'll get is wet. Now, the improvements in this edition include completely redrawn art, all according to my particular standard. Uh, I would call it proprietary, but hey, you know, if you can use it, if you want to imitate me, I'd be flattered to death. Other improvements include little blurbs called follow the flow. Follow the flow. What they tell you is how the currents and signals flow through various circuits shown in the book in the diagrams. Well, I've done that. I've uh, gone through a variety of these circuits already and expounded on the follow the flow blurbs in the book where they exist. On page 84, you will find figure 5-1. This is a so-called crystal set, or crystal radio receiver. The name crystal comes from the old uh, radio frequency detector diodes, which were very interesting little things. Look up cat's whisker. Cat's whisker. Go to uh, Wikipedia and enter that. I think they've got a a pretty good idea. You'll find out why they call it a crystal radio. And on page 85, there's a little follow the flow blurb. But I'd what I'd like to do, as I have done in previous videos in this sequence, is to actually draw the circuit and show you in a video how the signals go through it. So you start with an antenna, preferably a long wire antenna outside outdoors. Now this shows a chassis ground, but that chassis ground should go to a good earth ground. If you build this on an aluminum chassis, I don't know why you would build something this simple on an aluminum chassis, but that is a ground, the common ground. You have an inductor. This is, can be an air core inductor, or if you prefer to use a powdered iron core, you can wind it on a little toroidal powdered iron core. In any case, you're going to need a tap on this inductor. And the best kind of an inductor to use for this purpose is a so-called roller inductor. A roller inductor. Enter that in your search engine. They're kind of hard to find, and they're, but you can thereby adjust the position of this tap for optimum results. All right, so this whole business, you have a variable capacitor across that coil. Now remember, when lines cross in a schematic diagram, it does not indicate a connection between those wires unless you see a heavy black dot there. So these, these two crossing lines do not indicate connected wires. Okay, so what happens is the signal in the antenna resonates in this LC tuned circuit. And that LC circuit should be tuned to resonate at the frequency of the station that you want to bring in. Then you adjust the position of this tap for the strongest 
signal that you can get. That will ensure an impedance match between this resonance circuit and the ultimate output, which I have simply shown as a pair of terminals here in the schematic diagram figure 5-1. That output may go to a, an audio amplifier stage. It may go to a pair of headphones. Good, they need to be good high impedance headphones, the old military style. Otherwise, you will need to use an impedance transformer there. Your low impedance typical stereo headphones are not really any good for that. Here is the heart of the circuit, the diode. And it has to be an RF diode, an ordinary power supply diode like a rectifier diode will not work. It has too much capacitance in it. You need to get a good rectifier diode for the, or not a rectifier, <laughs> a good um, RF signal diode for this. And you can still find them. Uh, I believe there was a, uh, a supply that I got them from. I forget exactly where I got them, but uh, go on the internet and look for signal diodes and uh, you'll find some suppliers for those. It doesn't matter which direction you connect this diode in. What it does is it recovers the AM modulation, amplitude modulation, and that's what this thing is designed to hear. Amplitude modulated signals. Other types of signals it really won't recover. Frequency modulation won't work. Single sideband, Morse code CW, most digital modes in the amateur radio bands, it won't demodulate, but it will uh, recover that audio information from an AM signal, and that is known as an envelope detector. Because it detects or demodulates the signal in the radio frequency envelope, which is the way that the uh, radio frequency signal would look if you put it on an oscilloscope. That is the envelope that you will see. This will rectify that in effect at the high frequency, leaving only the audio components here. But to ensure that, you, that your radio frequency components don't get in there and mess up the operation of the circuit, you should include a radio frequency bypass capacitor here, and that can typically be in the range of about 0 0.01 microfarads or thereabouts for most applications. So the signal comes in here. This resonates an impedance match to provide the most signal. And notice that there's no battery, just like this paper-bound book, no battery to fail. This, the radio gets all of the energy that you hear at that output from the signal itself. And if you have a good mili old military-style pair of headphones, high-impedance headphones, that's high Z, high-impedance, then you will get a good signal here. And you'll actually, in most locations, be able to hear on the AM broadcast band, signals coming in, if they're local especially, you'll be able to hear them pretty well. And the selectivity isn't too good in a radio like this, but if you adjust this tap to the optimum position, and if you use a good quality inductor and variable capacitor, those two are getting difficult to find. But I did find a, uh, a variable capacitor at a parts supply shop. Again, look up variable capacitor on the internet and go shopping, and good luck. So with all of that, this is how this little circuit works, how the signal flows. You have a high frequency, radio frequency signal flowing here. This rectifies it, cuts off half of it. So what you get then is a variable audio signal here, 
and this also serves to filter this output, sort of like a rectifier filter capacitor, but at a much higher frequency. And then you get your audio here. You can run it to a bunch of amplifiers and listen to it on your hi-fi stereo set if you want. Stangibilisco from the Black Hills of Dakota Territory, United States of America, where it's going to be minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit tomorrow morning and the morning after that. I'm just hoping my new vehicle battery will do the job for me and I won't get stuck. At least I'll get stuck at home <laughs> if it fails. If it fails, I'll let you know. I'll make a video about it. Now, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, eh? Again, this has to do with the book Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics and incidentally also to drawing them. Go to my website, sciencewriter.net. Hit the videos link. It'll take you right to my YouTube channel. Then hit Beginner's Schematics Playlist. And you'll see all the videos that I'm doing for this book. Until next time, so long.